Gretchen Baskerville, the author of The Life-Saving Divorce, Hope for People Leaving Destructive Relationships. And I've been a Christian divorce recovery leader since 1998. And today we're going to talk about how to effectively deal with criticism when you divorce. I want to give people of faith some hope and ideas on how to handle well-meaning folk who try to pressure you. My panelists today are Natalie Hoffman, who runs the Flying Free Sisterhood Women's Group. She's the mother of nine children. And Gina Kay, a former pastor's wife, professional health educator and speaker, and mother of four. Now let's get going. So here we go. I'm really excited to be with these two women, Natalie Hoffman of the Flying Free Sisterhood and Gina Kay a health educator and speaker. And so here we go. Our first question to you ladies is, no matter how serious the problems in our marriage, there's always someone who feels they must weigh in on our decision. So what a, tell us about your experience and what, what kind of criticism you received. Natalie, you're gonna go first. Okay. Um, well, I, you know, for, for years, the whole first part of my marriage, I was trying to get help and I never ever thought about divorce. It just wasn't even on my radar screen at all. It wasn't, until, and I remember actually towards the end, um, I went to a Christian counselor in my church. So she was a member of the church that I attended and she started off our session by saying, our very first session by saying, I just need you to know that if you ever start thinking that you're going to get a divorce, I will no longer be able to counsel you. And at that time, I, I had never thought about divorce. And I was kind of taken aback, like, wow, it seemed kind of controlling to me. But also I was thinking, well, I don't need to worry about that. So I'm not thinking about divorce. A year, less than a year later, I was thinking about divorce. Okay. And then the other person who um, really came right out and got in my face about divorce was an elder's wife, sweetest lady, but she noticed I was, I was sending some of the elders, they were trying to help me. I was sending some of them links to some of Leslie Vernick's things, her articles. And um, this woman went on her website and she sent me an email and she said, I was on Leslie Vernick's website and she just thinks it's fine for women to get divorced. And I just have to tell you that if you're reading things from her, that's very dangerous. You're going down a slippery slope to who knows where. And I just, I love you. And if I didn't care about you, I wouldn't be telling you to not be reading this material. Well, I, again, I hadn't been thinking about divorce, but all those two comments actually got me thinking about divorce. <laughs> believe it or not. And I started open, I, you know, I decided to do my own research. And so, um, and then, then of course, when I finally did after several years more, I finally did decide to file for divorce. And of course I got excommunicated. So that was on a massive scale. When you said one person or, you know, somebody who criticizes you, I'm thinking, well, my whole world criticized me for filing for divorce, so, and even gave me the boot, so that was my experience. Wow. wow, yeah, to be kicked out of your church because you divorced, that's, that's a lot of criticism. <laughs> okay, Gina, give us your story. Well, like Natalie, too, I just, I went into marriage um, never thinking or speaking about divorce, because it was not anything that was going to happen to me. It wasn't anything I would have chosen. Um, so 15 years into marriage though, I found myself also, uh, needing a divorce, uh, more than, I mean, never wanting one still. Um, but as I started, I, you know, it was a long journey, very long journey. And as I was starting to, you know, take those steps in conversations of realizing that that might be something that I needed, that's when the pushback started. And, um, and it was from my communities of faith. I mean, outside, for me, outside the church, it, there isn't the same critique and criticism. In fact, since my divorce, some people that outside the church have said, well, why didn't you do it sooner? Like, they're like, when they hear my story, they're perplexed. They're like, why did you stay in so long? <laughs> but, in, you know, but in the communities of faith I was in, um, the pushback came. And 
I married into a very conservative, um, you know, religious uh, Armenian family, big family, and the matriarch and patriarch of that family were also professional Christians. I mean, they taught people, uh, taught pastors how to preach. They mentored. Um, and so some of my greatest criticism came from my in-laws uh, because they, you know, I think they did not want to see this happen, um, but they also held very traditional views. And I mean, I was told kind of the pinnacle was, um, when I, you know, I was told that I was to suffer to the point of crucifixion. I mean, it was guilt and shame being beat up with scripture. And I was told I was disobedient. And somehow, despite the actions of their son, which had clearly been destructive from the beginning and had culminated in some pretty serious outcomes, uh, I was then equally disobedient in their eyes the moment that I started considering divorce. And um, it went beyond, I mean, my family has some very traditional values, the churches we were part of. And so somehow in this process, as I was seeking safety, I mean, I, the onslaught of criticism was intense. Yeah, the fact that they would tell you that you had to be crucified, that you had to sacrifice yourself is just unbelievable. I mean, that's really destructive. And it's, so common in our Christian circles. Um, outsiders, like you say, look at us and say, uh, people said, why do you even need to write a book on divorce? Everybody's divorcing. I said, well, we have, we have people in the Christian world who are in horrible marriages, who are uh, victims of uh, a pattern, as, as, um, as Natalie says, a pattern of sexual immorality of adultery, of domestic violence, of emotional abuse, of severe addictions and uh, neglect. And we're told we can't leave. And so, you know, what you were told was, was evidence of this kind of teaching that's rife in our, in our uh, community. Mm -hmm. yeah. yes. So um, I'll just jump in here with my story. So I too, you know, brought up good Christian kid, Loved the Lord, loved the Bible, great Christian parents. My parents uh, were, were just over here yesterday. Uh, they've been married at 60, wow, 61 years later on this month and, um, and going strong. And they were great examples to me of what a Christian marriage should be. And so I went into marriage, you know, doing all the right things, dating all the proper ways. You know, I met someone at church in the church singles group. Uh, he asked my father if, if he could date me, you know, uh, no sex before marriage, walked down the aisle as the radiant virgin bride in my beautiful white dress and 300 people at my wedding. And yet things were not as they seemed. And uh, there was a serious pattern of sexual immorality uh, that I discovered at year three, uh, but I just kept, you know, hoping and praying and trying harder and fasting and doing every, you know, you know, it, it, especially for those of us who've got sexual immorality going on in the marriage, we're the ones pressured to, you know, be more sexually available and so on and so forth. Anyway, when I when uh, there was kind of a, a final event that just was the pivot point. It, you know, it was like, no more, absolutely no more. I've got to get out. And I wasn't even ready for it emotionally or financially or in any way, but it, it hit and I, I had to go anyway. And so the criticism that sticks with me to this day, 25 years later, was going to my mother's a preschoolers group and I loved that group. It was a woman's group and we all sat around a round table and we heard a speaker and we, we you know, shared our, our hopes and dreams and challenges and we prayed for one another. And so I was really cautious. I really didn't wanna tell anyone because of the nature of you know, sexual addictions and things like that are just so embarrassing and so humiliating. And I didn't want to tell anyone. So I waited like, Oh, several months before I even told my my uh, pre mother or preschoolers group, and I would at at church I would just kind of slink, you know, into the back of the church after the church service had started. I didn't want to interact with anyone. 
I wanted to even, I pretended for two years, by the way, that I was still married. That's how humiliated and embarrassed I was and how afraid I was of, of, um, of criticism. But I finally felt like this was a safe group and I could tell them. And I, at the end, during the prayer time, we're sitting around the round table and I whispered, I'm going to have to get a divorce. I'm going through a divorce. By this time I had filed several months before. And one person at the table instantly said, well, you know you're gonna destroy your children. You really need to think this over. And I thought, do you, do you really think I haven't thought about my children? Do you really think that I haven't thought about this day and night for the last seven years? Do you really think that I didn't take this seriously, that I haven't counted the cost? And that's what I was thinking in my mind, because this is exactly what I dreaded, that kind of criticism. Another woman at the same table stood up, silently walked around the table, came over to me, and she knelt down and she just gave me a wordless hug. She just hugged me. And it was so fantastic. I took that hug to mean, you don't need to explain anything to me. I know your walk with the Lord. I know that you aren't the kind of person who's a quitter who would take the easy way out. I trust you. If this is in your judgment is what you feel you need to do, then do it. And those two, that contrast in just a five minute period sums up kind of how I feel about the whole issue of criticism uh, when you go through a divorce. Wow, that's a beautiful story. <laughs> yeah. It turns out that the lady who came over to me, I didn't know what her story was, but she had been a divorcee too. And she was remarried and had, you know, had ch children with her second husband. I had no idea. And here was a person who really got it yeah. and, and knew, so. When compassion is exactly the right response. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and, and this mistrust is so misplaced. So, all right, let's look at question number two. I'm going to put on my glasses again. So emotionally, what do you tell yourself when someone attacks you? And I'm going to ask Gina to address this one first. What do you do? What do you tell yourself now? Because it's not you've had it's happened more than once mm -hmm. what do you tell yourself emotionally sure right i mean emotionally i feel it i feel the pain of it every time but i think as i've grown you know i, I feel more distance between um those criticisms and my truth because there's something about getting really grounded and rooted in what i know to be true and it and that's part of the journey is coming to terms with it, um, remember, you know, knowing the story of what led to this and then getting the support of those that understand and have shared experiences. Um, but emotionally, I think I, like I've encountered a fair amount of ignorance from other people. And that's part of what I tell myself when I receive it is just, there's a lack of understanding and I find myself less and less inclined to try to explain depending on the relationship though. I sometimes see that as an opportunity for education because that is the, that's the number one way I know to change things is to be able to, um, to speak into that when it's appropriate. Um, but, but yeah, emotionally I tried to just, get my bearings and remind myself that not everybody understands and I'll process it with, with somebody that does. And that's, that's usually how I deal with it. So you know your truth. I know my but truth. Even, even though it kind of shakes you. Right. And I, as I look backwards, I'm like, I can see where it shook me to the core early on because I was so used to deferring to other people and looking to other people for guidance. And that's when you walk this journey and you come against criticism. Um, I mean, it, it does, it's transformative and it has matured me. And I am more in touch with like my truth and it's clarified. I mean, even that moment with my, 
my in-laws before where there are that scrutiny, it was a very clarifying moment for me because I had esteemed them as spiritual leaders and mentors and trusted family members. And, but like to see that God was leading me in a direction and, and it was contrary to them. Like it was a very clarifying moment. The fact that like, um, we have these personal relationships with God and, um, it really started to, to decipher for me between religion and God and just, you know, like this refining process of clarifying what's what, and that I'm the only one that lives my life, you know, nobody else they've, they've lived theirs. And so it just helped like get things really clear for me. Yeah. Nobody really knows what's going on behind closed doors. And well, there's not enough words in the, in the language. I mean, there's no way to catch people up either on the, the day in day out stuff that you live. Like at the end of the day, you're the one living it through it, you know, and there's really no way to, you can't like, despite what you can do to try to help somebody else understand at the end of the day, you know, you're the only one holding that truth. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And Natalie, what do you, t it's been a while for you too. It's been a few years. What do you tell yourself when, when uh, people criticize you? And I'm sure you get it as a, as a ministry leader online too. Mm -hmm. I still get a lot of it. <clears throat> you know, I, I'd like I, everything that Gina said is, I can totally relate to all of that. And just 100, it's, that's really, really wise. One of the ways that I've, that I try to think about it is that we all have this universe between our ears. It's our brain. And that universe is built on everything that was downloaded when we were growing up as children. And it has all of our experiences in there. And we all have kind of a, everybody that walks on this planet has kind of a rule book for how life is supposed to go. They have a rule book for other people and how, what other people have to do. And our rule books are all about making us feel better. So a lot of, I, I realized in our Christian world and our, our religious circles, there's a lot of rule books that that christians have for themselves and for other people and that's not necessarily the bible you know it's not just they like to say my rule book is the bible but it's not their rule book is based on all of their upbringing and all of their experiences or lack of and so when i started differentiating myself and i used to think that i had to capitulate to everybody else's rule book for me so depending on what group I was hanging out with, I would try to be like a chameleon and try to make them feel good or feel comfortable by my basically denying my identity in order to fit in with what they thought I should be or how they thought I should believe. And part of my journey, like Gina was talking about, it's this transformative process where you start realizing, wow, I actually can learn brand new things that maybe these people don't know. So if they criticize me, they're doing it out of their own universal or universe experience, their own learning. They maybe haven't read the books I've read. They maybe haven't talked to the people I've talked to. They, and they certainly haven't lived with the man I lived with. So they're operating out of that. So I make their criticism mean something completely different now than I used to make it mean. I used to make it mean that there's something wrong with me and my universe. Now I make it mean that that's just their universe and it has nothing to do with me. I mean, they think it has something to do with me, but that's nothing, I, I can't do anything about that. So even when I see things on Facebook or on social media, other social media platforms, or I get emails that are very critical or I get criticism from my family of origin, I, I don't have the same visceral reaction to it that I used to. I mean, I might, my heart might start pounding because it's a trigger for me and I, my brain, our brains, you know, they go in loops, right? But I'm so used to thinking in a completely different way now that the loop will trigger, but then I, in, my brain now interrupts that loop and it says, no, this is not about you. This is about them and it's going to be okay. And then I'm able to, talk to them from a place of um you know unconditional love for them and where they're at but also fully standing in my own identity and my own decisions and um there isn't that that tremendous amount of shame 
that I used to experience when someone would criticize me. So it's, it, that's one of the things I just think that we uh, survivors have this beautiful opportunity. I love how you called it a, a transformation, Gina. We have this beautiful opportunity to transform. And really what it is, it's going from emotional childhood to emotional adulthood. Mm -hmm. And not everyone does that. Not everyone actually gets to that place in life, but it's an opportunity that we're, you know, maybe it's, we're forced to do it through the fires, but I'm glad that I went through it. I would go through it again, just for the, the person that I have become and am still becoming because of those experiences. I want to just uh, hone in on one thing you said. You talked so well about how we felt like we needed to please every single group we were in and just this you know desire to you know boy i mean nobody can toe the line like people brought up in the church we know exactly where the boundaries are we know exactly what words we can say and what words that we can't say and so we just you know bent ourselves over backwards to just fit into that mold exactly right and now with our own truth, uh, we, I love how you said that, that that's their truth. They have rules that they've set up for themselves. And sure, they're trying to apply them to me, but those are their rules. And I have a different set of rules. And I don't need to be hostile toward them. I can, I can love them. I can care about them. I can understand why they have those rules. In some, in some respects, some of those a lot of their rules are the rules I had maybe 30 years ago when I was actually writing magazine articles about how, what a great wife I would be. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I totally understand it. So let's, I want to, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, okay. just listening. <laughs> um, so question number three is, is there any way of getting ahead of this? Like, we're probably going to be talking, people are watching, and there will be some people who have been thinking about a divorce for a long time. And maybe they're separated, maybe they're not separated, maybe between them and God, they know, they know it's time to go, and they're just waiting for the right time. What do you recommend? Is there any way you can get ahead of this thing? Is there any way you can educate the people around you or the people most, um, most important to you? Uh, or is that sort of a hopeless cause? Um, how do you view that? And I'm gonna pick on Natalie first. <laughs> um, I don't think it's a hopeless cause. I don't know that it should be our focus. I think educating other people who are not, my mantra kind of is, I like to educate people or give them input if they ask me for it. You know, so unsolicited advice, I try to stay away from that. Just because people who aren't asking questions and wanting to know, they're not usually open-minded anyways. So it's a waste of my time and effort and energy when I could be using that to help somebody else. So I don't necessarily think that's our job as survivors to educate our pastors or educate our elders. Now I know a lot of us, me included, feel this strong need that we, that we want to. We, we just think, you know, I get it, I see it, why can't they? And maybe if I could find the right words, they would understand it. And then they could transform their church and the, you know, and you get all these great ideas about how you can use your horrible situation to turn your church around and turn all these lives around. And I just found and talked, talking to hundreds of women who've literally tried to do this. And it just, it doesn't work for the most part. It's very, very rare that you might talk to someone who's not interested and then end up getting them to be interested and learn. Now, on the other hand, there are people who may ask you questions. And then I think there's a lot of hope to answer them and to provide information and to lead them to the resources that you've read. Like Gretchen's book is a beautiful book to be able to give to someone who asks you, you know, how did you come to this place where you decided that it was okay or that 
God was still going to love you if you got divorced or that it was even biblical to get divorced. And you can say, well, I read this wonderful book. That way you don't have to necessarily take the pressure on your, uh, put it on yourself to teach them all the things, but put it on Gretchen's book to teach them all the things, you know, <laughs> and then you're there to maybe answer their questions if they have any about your personal experience. But otherwise, I just think your power is not in controlling the universe all these other people your power is taking back your own power and controlling your own life and just by your living a, a life that's an example to those around you of someone who's loving jesus making hard choices going through pain and doing it with with an open hands to pain and knowing that that's the currency of transformation that they that there will be people whose lives end up changing because just by watching your example. Just live your life. Live your life in communion with Christ. And the right people who are ready to hear those things are going to wonder why, and they're going to come to you and ask. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so Gina, how would you answer that question for yourself? Right, well couple things. Uh, first of all, I would say to read and listen to Brene Brown. Uh, she has been a great influence in my life and she's um, someone that brought back to our attention a, a Theodore Roosevelt quote about it's not the critic that counts. And the imagery of that, um, about being in the arena and being on the floor of the arena when your face is marred with blood, sweat, and tears, and then having this arena and stand of people that are critiquing, um, she has something to say about that. And she has definitely given me permission to, um, to say, you know, I'm not open to everybody's feedback because not everybody's on the floor of the arena and can give me feedback. And she also talks about being aware of who's in the arena because it is, it's helpful to get ahead of the criticism. It's helpful to recognize that we are walking in an arena and there are multiple different kinds of people sitting in the stands. And she says, you need to make sure to reserve seats for compassion and empathy. And I love that. That's part of how we get ahead of criticism is we really invest in making sure that we have places and sources and people that that give us compassion and empathy um and and pour into that so that's one thing um and then uh to yeah mention what natalie was saying too about like the third party resources are helpful when there's a a voice of somebody else that's speaking for us because sometimes in our circles it's just there's so much emotion uh, and um, people, you know, they're, they're highly tied to the story and when they know each other, but sometimes that third party can be heard when it's somebody outside the situation. When I worked in addiction treatment and recovery, I learned about interventionist and when there is an issue, like ideally, like if I could rewind the tapes, I would have hired an interventionist, that third party to come in and educate the family system. They sit down, they talk with the family system. We don't have this um, developed very well for survivors yet, but we need that same continuum of care. And that's something like I can see myself even serving in that role as someone that's chosen to get professionally educated in these topics, to be able to help enter a, a, a situation with family, friends, community, a church even, and be that third party that's outside of the specific situation and be there to help speak into it and just give helpful knowledge and information. Um, lastly, I want to say, and this is, this is tricky. This is from my own journey. Um, but we were talking about control and it, it it's so tempting. I've struggled to want to want to control sometimes what's happening, but part of what I've been up against, um, is that I have an ex-husband who has not taken responsibility and ownership for his stuff and what he did. And they say sometimes when someone can't control you anymore, they control what others think about you. Mm -hmm. So I've had someone who's chosen to be vindictive and throw me under the bus and actively work to create confusion and smear, they call it a smear campaign. And so the, 
further I am into my journey, the more I'm realizing that I need to counter that because otherwise that's the only narrative that's out there. So I have gotten more um, vocal with my kids, with my family members and speaking my truth because I have, that's part of how I'm getting ahead of it is I'm like, I almost am, I feel compelled. Like, I feel like I have to say because of the actions of the, because of the situation. Yeah, that's a really an interesting topic. And I just ran across somebody on Facebook talking about something similar and the idea of when you have a, a lot of false accusations being hurled at you, uh, you don't need to mention them by name, but you, you know, you, you do have a choice. You can go, there are people who it's a better strategy to go completely gray rock, which is just to ignore it and walk away from it and not give it any, not, you know, starve it of all air. But the other side is if it really does get, grow in its power, some people choose to address it, uh, maybe not addressing that person particularly, but saying, hey, I've, you know, I've heard that people are saying this about me, but you need to know this fact, this fact, this fact. And I think that's a very personal decision as to what direction a person goes.